Good morning. It's good to see this good number here this morning to uh, worship God together. Thank you for being part of our assembly. If you're visiting with us, we want you to know that you're a special guest, and we invite you back anytime you have opportunity. I would encourage everyone to get a copy of the bulletin so you'll have a record of those who need our prayers and other pertinent announcements for our family here. A couple of updates to our sick list. Uh, Gary Grove had a stress test last week, but he tells me that it just shows that he needs more tests. So those will be uh, hopefully scheduled this week. He's going to see his cardiologist again this week. Uh, update regarding Brenda Smitherman. This is Shannon Abel's mother is now under hospice care and requests, the family requests your prayers on her behalf. Continue also to remember uh, Frank Harris not doing well at this time. Also Beverly Elliott is scheduled for uh, open heart surgery uh, this Tuesday so please keep her and Don in your prayers as she uh, goes through this surgery and the recovery. Continue to remember also Jerry Carter uh, with her chemo treatments and also Miley Naramore. This is Luanna Cook's uh, granddaughter and Logan Naramore's daughter has had some complications uh, since uh, her birth a couple of weeks ago. Also remember Tom Green over in Nashville, that's Bobby Moore's brother, and also the minister of uh, the uh, church in Etowah, Bill Korn, is suffering from uh, complications of COVID-19 and has been moved to a facility in Knoxville for further treatment. So please remember all these in your prayers. We want to extend our sympathy, as we made mention of recently, to Bill McCulley in the passing of his sister, also Joyce Proctor in the passing of her sister-in-law last week. If you have taken one of the coin boxes for the Tennessee Children's Home uh, from the back table, please remember that it needs to be returned by uh, November the 1st. If you want to put those on Faith's desk, she will make sure that they get uh, taken care of. All right. Halloween is approaching, so we're going to uh, have our annual trunk or treat on Wednesday night, October the 28th, following our evening uh, Bible study. So as usual, uh, we want to practice that as safely as possible out in the parking lot, and uh, the children can dress up, but they need to refrain from that until after our Bible classes are over. More to come on that. Um, Buford has made available some DVDs. Uh, some of you may have seen these. Why are there so many churches for Brother Don Blackwell? Very good content that you can share with your friends and family members. They are on the table in the library, so please take uh, one or as many of those as you need uh, to make, make use of those. I think that's all the announcements. I do have one card I want to read. It says, Your kindness has made a difference, and your thoughtfulness touched my heart. Thank you. Thank everyone so much for thinking of us and baby Owen on such a short notice. You don't know how much it meant to us for all of you to do that. We are forever grateful and love everyone so much. God is good. Nicolette and Chandler. Leading us in our worship this morning, our Brother Carl will lead our singing, and Brother Jerry Corbin will preside over the Lord's Supper. At the appropriate time, Brother Tom Levi will have our opening prayer. Closing prayer will be Brother Marvin Shipley. Let's bow as we begin our worship together. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this beautiful Lord's Day morning. Thankful for the health that we each enjoy, that we can be here to worship you. We pray, Father, that we would clear our minds of the cares of this world and focus upon you, the true object of our worship. We are here for you and not ourselves. So we are so grateful that we have this opportunity that we can be together with those of like precious faith to worship you. Father, bless us here as you have in the past. Be with those who are not doing well. Be with those who are anticipating tests and surgeries and those sorts of things this week. We thank you, Father, for loving us. We thank you for hearing and answering our prayers. Bless us now as we worship you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Five eighty one. Five eighty one.
coming year in the suffer of the Lord. Does everyone have a individual Lord? Lord's Supper. If not, we can get one to you. Okay. You need one over here? Okay. All right. Sorry about that. As you know, the uh, early church met on the first day of the week, each first day of the week, to take the Lord's Supper and preparing some thoughts as we uh, take part in in this feast, I'd like to read to you from Romans chapter 5, verses 5 through 11. Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified, by his blood we shall be saved from wrath through him. In verse 10, for if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. There's some words that really stand out there. I, I selected three to bring to your attention. One is justified. And without the death of Jesus Christ, we, we would have no opportunity for justification to God. And it mentions the word reconcile, reconciliation. We would not be reconciled to God without the blood shed by Jesus Christ. And one thing that brought me to this particular set of scripture is the word hope. Now think about hope. Without hope, why would we even be here this morning? Now think about that. Why even come? Why be involved in the worship of the church? We can say, well, it's, it's commanded or something I've always done. But without hope, then we would be a people really most, most miserable. But because of this supreme sacrifice by Jesus Christ, we now have hope. You remember that Jesus told his, his disciples there that where I go, I go to prepare a place for you. And that where I am, you may be also. So that's the hope that we have, that we can be with the Lord someday. And this is why it's so important that this sacrifice was made once and for all for our sins. Let's go to God and offer thanks for the, for the love. Father in heaven, we are a most blessed people. We are so thankful, Father, that we do have hope because of this supreme sacrifice made by your son, this terrible treatment that he endured to his body, emotionally and everything that can be imagined by this terrible death upon the cross. Because of this, we now have hope. And as we would take this, as we take this bread, we're reminded of that beaten and torn body. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's pray and give thanks for the fruit of the vine. Our Father in heaven, we continue our praise of thee and our thanksgiving for the hope that we have. 
as we consider the blood that was spilled that day through the terrible abuse of your son's body, the blood that poured from his side, and as we try to contemplate that terrible event, without it, we realize we would not have the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. And it's through his name we pray. Amen. Of course, that uh, concludes the Lord's Supper, but because of uh, convenience, we now have an opportunity to uh, lay by in store on the first day of the week. We know that God loves a cheerful giver, and I want God to, to love me. I know he does, but to know that my heart lies where my, my money lies, and it tells a lot about us sometimes uh, as we contemplate that, as we examine ourselves uh, and and our giving. Let's offer thanks to God for this, this privilege. Father in heaven, we're, we're thankful that we can return back a portion to you, Father, a, a goodly portion, because you gave all to us, and you own everything anyway in the world, and it all belongs to you, so we return this because you know that uh, you care for us, and you love us, and that's so the work of the of your congregations throughout the world can carry out the work that you have us to do. Thank you, Father, for this privilege. In Jesus' name, amen. There's a basket out in the foyer available for your giving. If you did not have an opportunity to weigh in on your way out, you can, you'll have that uh, opportunity to, uh, to lay by in store. And thank you. Four sixty eight. <clears throat> Four sixty eight. <clears throat> oh, for the thousand tongues to sing, my great Redeemer's praise. My God is up, my God. His grace, my grace is forever, and my love only is holy. To spread through all the earth, the Lord, the Lord is all His name. Jesus, the name, in charge of me, that is the there's music in the sinner's ears, tears, life, and hell, and peace. He breaks the power of cancel sin, he sets the prisoner free. His blood can make the fathers clean, his blood of it for me. Our Heavenly Father, ruler of the universe and giver of ever-perfect ever gift, we humbly bow this morning, Father, thanking you for this privilege, the privilege that you have given us, uh, Father, with reasonable health, that we can uh, have the breath of life to lift up our prayers and to remember you, Father, in your death as you suffered and died on Calvary's cross for the remission of our sins. And Father, may we never lose sight of where our blessings come from. And certainly, Father, realize that you are in control of all things and not mankind. 
As we see the leaves change and a new season begin, we also recognize, Father, that through the ages this has happened and it's, it's your will and it brings man's mind back to the, thought, to the fact that you are an all-powerful God. Father, our cup runneth over with many great blessings. There are so many in this world right now that are struggling, that do not have this privilege. Members of the church that have, the churches that have burned in the various cities of our country that the floods have overcome. But we pray for them, Father, and we pray for all those that are Take, that have been taken out of their natural place, and we pray for them earnestly, Father, that they will find peace through you. Father, we're made aware also that there are those that have returned to us that, uh, that have been uh, ill, and certainly, Father, the smiles on their face as they walk through the door is a sign of your healing mercy. And also, Father, we realize that and uh, from the bulletin and from what we know from uh, various sources that there are still those out there that need our prayers. And at this time, Father, we uh, offer a prayer for those that have lost loved ones, for the uh, ones that are facing surgery this week, for those that, that uh, are downtrodden and, and hurt right now, Father, that need, need uh, your your loving mercy, and we thank you, Father, for each each and everything that you do for us. Well, Father, we pray for this great country, and we uh, we pray as we move forward uh, that we will always uh, live accordance to your will, and that our leaders will take you into consideration when they're making decisions that affect us. Because, Father, we uh, uh, know that uh, there's a lot of dissension and. Certainly, we earnestly pray for our, our leaders. We give thanks for our elders here. We give thanks for Joel as he prepares himself and he stands before us. I pray, Father, that if anyone here has not uh, rendered obedience, that they will consider that because we're not promised another day or another hour, and we know that the, the, the uh, fact that our lives close very quickly as a vapor. And certainly, Father, we pray that... Uh, that they will consider that before it's everlastingly too late. Father, we, uh, we uh, offer our hand uh, uh, to those that are less fortunate, uh, and we pray, Father, that we will always remember them. And certainly, Father, we, uh, uh, our elders are, are uh, overwhelmed right now with various problems and everything, and we pray for them, and we pray for all those. It is our duty to pray for Forgive us our many sins, Father, because we know that we fall short many, many times. But, Father, I ask that you will forgive me of my sins, and I will ask you to forgive the sins of, sins of those that earnestly pray, pray at the foot of the cross. In Jesus' precious holy name I pray. Amen. Five eighty three. Our song of invitation will be number five eighty four, which is the same opening. Five eighty three. Would you stand with me, please? <clears throat> Sing to me all heaven let me Showers of great blessing over my heart will flow. Sing to me of heaven, let me fondly dream of its cold and glory and its pearly gleam. Sing to me when shadows of the evening fall. Sing to me of heaven, sweetest song of Dreaming of the colors that so long have gone in a fairer region by the angel flow. They are happy as they sing that old sweet song. 
Sing to me, oh, heaven, let me fondly drink of its cold glory of its pearly rain. Sing to me when shadows of the evening fall. Sing to me, oh, heaven, sweetest song of all. Sing to me, oh, heaven, tender. Till the shadows on me rise and swiftly go. When my heart is weary, when the day is long, sing to me of heaven, sing that old sweet song. Sing to me of heaven, let me fondly dream of its glory and glory of its pearly. Shadows of me, sing, sing to me, oh, heaven, sweetest song of all. That you are here this morning, and it's another one of those great days. Last Sunday was a little rainy, but we're thankful for beautiful days like today and the opportunity to be together. We're thankful that you've chosen to be here. We're thankful to all of those who are able to join us online and uh, even worship in that particular way and not be here. We're thankful for that avenue that's uh, made available to us, and we're just appreciative for the opportunity to encourage one another this morning. Uh, we oftentimes pray for our sick, and we have a long sick list, and we try to stop from time to time, give thanks for those who have uh, returned to their good health. It's good to see uh, Harrison with us this morning. Many of you know Harrison visiting with us, uh, often with Cody and Santana on game nights and things like that. We prayed for him uh, back earlier in the year as he was one who was dealing with several health issues. But uh, it's just... It's great when we can uh, pray for folks, but it's also great when we can give thanks for many things. And we try to, to often pause and do that when folks are able to be restored to at least close to their normal walks of life and their normal health. And uh, certainly we have many that we can continue to pray for that have been on our list. A couple of weeks ago, or a few weeks ago now, we began a series of lessons and we talked about the idea that it's important for us to understand why we believe what we believe, why we practice what we practice. We said we did this a year ago. Uh, through the month of October, didn't necessarily plan it that way, but it kind of worked out for us to consider, and it's good for us, for maybe at least once a year or even more, to consider the things that we do and the things we believe and the things we practice. We try to say, the elders try to say from time to time, and I will try to say from the pulpit from time to time, that, that we don't want you just to take what we say or what the elders say, and that be it. We want you to check out what is said in the Bible, because our goal is to follow what the Bible has to say. That should be your goal, at goal as well. And if we do that as a congregation, then we know we're on the right track. You see, when Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7 there, we've talked about the Sermon on the Mount, that it's not just everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord. It's just not everyone that just claims that, yes, I believe in Jesus, We've been talking about the plan of salvation and things on the last couple of Wednesday nights in our class, and, and we've said there's lots of folks who claim to believe, but it's about doing the will of the Father, and so it's important that we consider in all things that we do that we're trying to do the will of the Father. So a couple of weeks ago, we talked about the idea of understanding why we partake of the Lord's Supper and why we do that each first day of the week. And even last week, we turned it around a little bit, and we said, why don't we believe in tithing, because that's a phrase that many people know and many people use. And so why is it that we don't use that word in this congregation or typically in churches of Christ? Why do we talk about our offering or our giving? And so it's important that we even consider that. You know, each summer my family has an opportunity to go to McCroy Bible Camp. And some of our young people have had an opportunity to go with us as well. And while we're there each summer, I have the distinct honor of getting to serve as the Steve Harvey of the McCroy Family Feud. Now, I don't know how many of you keep up with Family Feud nowadays. That was Richard Dawson for some of you, or uh, Ray Combs, or Richard Carn. if you followed Family Feud over the years. But it's always fun because we have a good time, and 
the kids play each other, and then they play the adults, and, and we have a good time enjoying that. So I thought it'd be good for us, as I was considering the lesson this morning, that we play the feud for just a minute. I'm not going to call anybody up, and I'll be honest, I didn't stop and survey 100 people either, but you'll get the point as we go through uh, the beginning of our lesson here. If you were to be stopped, or you were to stop and talk to someone, even in Soddy Daisy, dollar store up the road, or Walmart, or somewhere, and you made mention of the fact that you attend the Church of Christ, I attend the Saudi Church of Christ. What are they more than likely to say? Well, we might say, number three, they're often going to say, well, you guys are the folks that don't drink and y'all don't dance, right? We'd say, well, that's kind of true. There's a little more to it than that when you really study the Bible. The Bible promotes the idea, of course, of not consuming beverage alcohol. And, and when we think about the way that dancing is typically done, even especially today, yes, we try to avoid those types of things because of typically what takes place around them. But that's a lot of times what people think when you say you attend maybe the local church of Christ. Secondly, maybe, and again, I didn't actually survey folks, but a lot, oftentimes you hear the ones, you guys the only folks, you guys are the ones who think you're the only ones going to heaven, right? And, and again, you might say, well, that's not exactly true because it's, it's going to take a little more time and study. We need to open our Bible and talk about it. But, but yes, Jesus promotes the idea, even himself, that, that only the few are going to go down the straight and narrow and on the path to an eternal home in heaven. And while that few is not designated as only those who, who sit in the Saudi Church of Christ on Sunday morning, there's more to be discussed, but that's what a lot of people think when they say, when you say, maybe, that you attend the Church of Christ. But maybe the first one that you often get, especially here in the South, is y'all are the ones that don't have a piano on stage, right, and in your worship. And yeah, that's oftentimes what we might hear, because somebody says, y'all don't have instruments in your worship. And that's kind of typically one of the most well-known things in a general sense when you talk about the churches of Christ. And so that may be what you hear if you were to mention someone, even just out of the blue, you could be in Saudi Daisy, you could be in Chattanooga, you could be uh, in Disney World or anywhere. And if that were to come up, this is probably one of the first things that folks would mention because it causes us to be a little different than everybody else. And yes, there's no piano on stage or even off stage that's played or used. There's no guitar or drums or, or mechanical instruments of music, we sometimes use that phrase, that we use in our worship. And so it's going to help us this morning to think about why we believe. But as we've done, we could say why we don't believe in using instruments in our worship, or we might say, why is it that we believe in a cappella singing? Now, neither one of those is necessarily wrong. We can look at it from every angle, and we're going to kind of do that this morning as we go through the lesson. And it's true. This is a little bit of a deeper subject as well, just as those others that we put on the board it can take a while. Uh, I've heard at least two or three night debates. I know Brian has as well. Two or three night worth of debates, almost an hour or so each uh, of debates on you know, using instruments in our worship. So we're going to try to condense it down this morning. And I think it would be beneficial, us for, beneficial for us as well to understand when we think about the idea of a cappella singing. So what is a cappella singing? That's going to be the first place to start. Some folks are familiar with that term. In fact, uh, you know, you can go on YouTube and, and if you look up like a cappella singing or uh, I've even found recently there are like international barbershop quartet competitions that you can watch hours of. And if you enjoy singing, it's very great. It's very uh, encouraging if you like singing because it's very beautiful harmonies. And so uh, we understand the idea that a cappella and it's even become popular a little bit in popular music. There are some groups. There was a, a television show a few years ago that, that had groups compete without instrumental accompaniment. And that's the difference. Now, what's interesting, and we're going to touch on this, but the idea of the word a cappella actually comes from a little bit of the Latin or the Latin through the Italian, but it originally meant in the style of the church. If someone used the phrase a cappella, they were saying that it was in the style of the church. And while we don't mean it that way exactly, we are considering the idea of without instrumental accompaniment. That's what people would notice. If someone walked off the street, just walked into our parking lot and walked in the door, that might be one of the first things that would stand out from other, the, other places, certainly even in our own community and around the world when it comes to our particular worship. So that's what we mean when we think about a cappella singing. Yes, with our voices, without instrumental accompaniment. 
It might help us to go a little bit further just to kind of continue on with our theme here. Some folks would say, well, why don't you use instruments? And we might notice, well, first of all, it's not because we don't like music. I mean, most of us here agree that we enjoy music. In fact, we listen to things in the car. I, I want to listen to podcasts. I don't know how many of you enjoy listening to podcasts. Some of you are really good about listening to sermons, you know, maybe as you travel down the road. I like that, but I really like my music. I, I get in the car and I try to listen to a podcast maybe about self-help and that kind of things. And next thing I know, I turn it back to the radio because I just want to listen to some good music. We enjoy music. So it's not that we don't have a piano or instruments because we don't enjoy music. It's also because, not because we can't afford it. Some folks say, well, you know, you must not have enough money in order to pay for some of those things, so that's why you don't have it. Well, no, it's not because we can't afford it. I'm sure if the elders wanted to fix the budget a certain way, we could make room to buy some instruments or that kind of thing. So it's not because we can't afford it. Well, why don't you have music? Is it because nobody can play an instrument in your congregation? Well, I mean, that's not true either. I'm not sure that I'm ready to listen to a band of Brian Sorello on the drums or Jerry Corbin on the guitar or anything like that. I don't know that they're, they're able to do that. I'm not ready to hear that band just yet. I don't think they're going to make it on the radio. But regardless, we do have some folks that can play instruments. I know that. So it's not because we don't have any talent. Well, you know, we don't have anybody, so let's just leave that alone. That's not it either. So why is it that we don't have instrument or why, instruments? Or why is it that we just sing with our voices? Number one. It's a matter of authority. This is really what the, the discussion usually comes down to. And there are, again, different sides of this. There are lots of ways we can talk about it. Um, there's, you know, we can go back to the Old Testament. Some folks like to do that and talk about what the Old Testament says. And suffice it to say this morning, we're going to have to boil it down to just a few points for our, our 30 minutes or so here in this sermon. But number one, typically we would say it comes down to the fact that it is a matter of authority. And what's interesting is, in life, almost all things are a matter of authority. We're getting ready to go through an election. You're not just allowed to walk down the street anywhere you want to go and place your vote. You're just not allowed for anyone to show up and just say, well, I want to vote. Uh, and, you know, it, there's, some, there's some authority. There's some rules and regulations. There's some things that we're supposed to do and not supposed to do. And, and there are only certain folks that have the authority to then take our vote so that we can vote. And that's just one example. We think about our police force, our government, lots of things. There are folks who would show up on your door and you would say, why are you here? And of course, first of all, often they're supposed to show their badge or their whatever to claim they have the authority to do what they are about to do. So it's a matter of authority. In our lives, it's about a matter of authority. Colossians chapter 3 you notice that verse 16, if you turn there, I don't have verse 16 on the screen, but Colossians 3, 16 is one of the places that we go to when we talk about our singing. But what's interesting is, is connected with that in verse number 17 is this particular phrase. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. In everything that we do, we do it in the name, or we might say, the authority of Jesus. Does that come when it talks about taking the Lord's Supper each first day of the week? Well, yeah. Does that matter when it talks about our giving? Yeah. Does it matter when it talks about our praying, our singing, our worship? Yes. And we might even go further than that if we had time this morning to discuss lots of things that we should do in the name of the Lord Jesus. All things that we do should have some matter of authority behind them. Sure, there are lots of trivial or menial decisions we make every day, such as what we have for breakfast or uh, things like that, that, that don't necessarily matter. A lot of times we might throw in that category what we put on our body, what we wear. And I might argue that I would think that we could consider that even as well, that we do it by the authority of Jesus, by the authority of God, what God has told us to do, even when it comes to what we wear from time to time. So, number one, it's a matter of authority. Colossians 3.16 talks about singing. Colossians 3.17 talks about the authority with which we do the different things that we do here in this life. Number two, the matter of authority is important, and it sort of sets the tone for what we're talking about. But when it comes to the authority of God, it's interesting to consider that silence is often an important discussion to have. And we might say that the silence of God is prohibitive. Now, there's a couple of different things you could say sometimes when it comes to the silence 
of authority or the silence of instructions. Let's talk about a couple of those when it comes to silence. What about if you go to a restaurant? Oftentimes we go to a local restaurant and they say, well, the restrooms are back there. And sometimes you even go through a door. And you open a door to a hallway, and sometimes there's three doors down that particular hallway. One of them says, authorized personnel only, or authorized personnel. You might say, well, I know that it doesn't say no patrons, no folks who are here to eat, but I know that I'm not supposed to go in there. It doesn't have to give a list of everyone who might set foot in here for me to understand that I don't need to go into that room. Also down that hallway, you oftentimes find two other doors. One has a picture of a kind of stick figure, I guess, if you will, that often has a little skirt on it and one doesn't. Well, it doesn't have to say uh, no men on the one with a little skirt for us to understand often that men aren't supposed to go in there. We understand that the silence of the picture of the woman depicting a woman means that that's where women are supposed to go and the other one means that's where men are supposed to go. It doesn't have to give the full list for us to say, well, I don't know if I'm supposed to go in that one or not. What if you send your child, I guess you wouldn't send your child, but a teenager or uh, a member of your household to the store? This might work better with husbands and wives, all right? Wives, you send your husband to the store and you say, I need a gallon of milk and I need a loaf of wheat bread. Now, if you're in my household, I'm going to come home with a gallon of of milk and a loaf of wheat bread and a package of double stuff Oreos. That's what I'm going to come home with. And so my wife is going to say, well, why did you come home with Oreos? I did not say to buy, excuse me, double stuff Oreos. Why did you come home with double stuff Oreos? Because I didn't say that. You didn't say that, so I thought it'd be okay to do that. Now, the wife's probably going to be upset with me, and certainly if it's our children, oftentimes we're going to be upset. I didn't say that. Well, you also didn't say that I couldn't buy chips and I couldn't buy shoes and I couldn't buy... Now, oftentimes, the idea of silence when it comes to things is authoritative, and it's prohibitive because it means not, I don't have to list everything on the candy aisle at Walmart for you to understand I didn't expect you to buy all that chocolate when you came home. If you have your Bible, you know, might notice in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse number 6 that Paul kind of promotes this idea as well. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse number 6, Paul says, Now these things, brethren, I have figuratively transferred to myself and Apollos for your sakes, that you may learn in us not to think beyond what is written. Not to think beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up on behalf of one against Another. We begin to see this idea even in Scripture that if we're going to take everything that God says and expect Him to list everything that He doesn't want us to do, as opposed to thinking that when He leaves, says this and leaves it at that, that maybe that silence is then prohibitive, we're going to have a, a problem because there a, sure are a lot of things that aren't mentioned. By the way, in this time of election and politics, some folks would tell you that the Bible never actually says don't. Don't have, abor don't have an abortion. It doesn't use that phrase, so maybe it's okay. Now, that's, a, that's a big minefield there, and we'll have to move on from that for the time being. But a lot of folks would say that. They say, the Bible says don't use heroin. Well, no, it doesn't use the word heroin, I don't believe, anywhere in it. But what does God mean when he says certain things? And he, he doesn't say every single thing that he doesn't want us to do. The, the principle of silence is kind of interesting when it comes to the commands of God as well. So moving along here, number three. When we think about what God has authorized, not worrying about what he, exactly even what he has said and what he hasn't said in silence, what has he said? What has he authorized? And when we look on the pages of the New Testament, which is what we're concerned with, we don't live under the Old Testament, we don't tithe in the same way that they tithe, uh, we don't do other things that they do, such as offer sacrifices. That's one interesting thing we didn't even get into last week. Some folks say we should tithe. The Old Testament says tithe. The Old Testament also says to, to do animal sacrifices. Do we do those? Well, no? Okay. We got a different discussion then. Well, all that aside, thinking about the New Testament, what has God authorized? Well, God has only authorized singing. There are ten passages listed on the screen, and these are the ten that are usually referenced when it comes to this idea of worship and singing. You see a few from Matthew and Mark, and then you move on further into the letters of Paul and even uh, James and Hebrews there, and each one of these we use or we see the phrase or the word used of singing. 
or even having sung, or you even see down there from Hebrews 13, 15, the idea of the fruit of their lips. So there are at least 10 passages here that certainly we won't have time to go through each one as we consider what God has said. And what he has said is that they were singing. When people were praising and worshiping God, they were singing. Acts chapter 16, as we think about Paul and Silas, who are in prison. They're not sitting on the comfortable cushioned pews that we're sitting on, but they're sitting in prison and they're singing praises to God. We know Colossians 3, 16, and we're going to come back to Ephesians 5, 19. Those are the two passages that we oftentimes think about when it comes to our New Testament worship and the way that we worship God in song. But singing is all that God has authorized. Some of you are trying to jot those down. If I cut you off for the sake of time here, I can certainly get you a copy of that. As we talk about authority, we do see in the Bible sometimes that there is generic and specific authority. Let's look at a few examples here. We won't go through each one if you don't uh, want to turn there exactly, but you'll be familiar. Genesis chapter 6, we see that God tells Noah to build an ark. If God told Noah to build an ark and he said simply of wood, that would have left it pretty generic. And I would assume that Noah could then use any type of wood that he could find, what might even be closest, what might be easiest to harvest out of the trees. But if God says, I want you to use gopher wood, Noah understands that he's supposed to, by that specific instruction, by that specific command, by that specific authority, to use gopher wood. One of the interesting ones that we oftentimes reference is Naaman in 2 Kings chapter 5. When Elisha tells Naaman what to do, he tells them to go wash or dip in the Jordan River seven times. And we say, well, and in fact, what's interesting is when that reference, if you go back and look at 2 Kings 5 there, Naaman even asked about two other rivers. He says, why aren't those good enough? Well, I mean, we can debate that all day. Our kids ask us that question all the time. Well, why? It doesn't matter. It's what I said to do. And Naaman says, what, what's wrong with these other two rivers? And Elisha doesn't proceed to go through the entire argument of the, the content of the water, maybe in the balance of the chemicals. No. God said, and I'm telling you as God's spokesman, to go wash seven times in the Jordan River. And we say, what if Naaman had gone to the far far, or had gone to one of the other rivers, or had only done it six times, or had done it eight times? What would have happened? I would assume he wouldn't have been cleansed of his leprosy. Go dip in the Jordan seven times. We think about the Passover. If God had said, hey, you guys, find your best animal. Whatever's closest, if you're running out of time, just find the smallest. What would have the least amount of blood? Don't worry about it. Just do whatever you think. Just find your animal and sacrifice that animal. But instead, God gives pretty specific instructions. And you even notice there Ephesians 5, 19 that we're going to talk about here in the next slide, I believe. But, but if God had just talked about in general, just make, make music or, or, you know, worship me, but, but do whatever you want to do, as opposed to saying, sing. And even there's one more reference there at the very bottom. Now, I know this one's a little uh, odd because we don't use cola around in these parts very much, do we? But if we were to say, go to, into the uh, gas station and buy me a canned soft drink, and uh, you might come out with anything. It could be a Coke, which, of course, is the word we oftentimes use, a Sprite, a Dr. Pepper, uh, or anything. If I say, go in and buy me a Pepsi, I would expect you to come out then with a Pepsi. I've given you specific authority even as God has done in these particular passages that we've noticed very quickly. So Ephesians 5, 18 and 19, this is the one that we oftentimes talk about. And do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation. We often talk, talk about Ephesians 5, 19, but if you look at these two verses, notice together, let us notice together that number one, there is a negative command. When we say there's a negative command, that means don't do it. So number one, do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation. So here's a, a negative command that God gives. But then there's also a positive command. Uh, Paul says, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, do not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. Now the blanks are a little off there. I underlined it on the screen, but if you're following along with your notes, you'll see what you're filling in there. Be filled with the Spirit. That's what we're supposed to do. That's great, Paul. Thank you for that instruction. That's good. How are we to be filled with the Spirit? He continues on, of course, by inspiration. Be filled with the Spirit by, number two, speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. 
Now, when you hear a debate or read a debate book on this particular topic, they'll spend much time looking at the Greek words that are used here and that kind of thing. And for the sake of time this morning, we won't be able to do that, although we can. And we'd love to have that discussion if you would like to at a different point or someone you know. We can certainly point you to some good material or sit down ourselves and have a discussion. But be filled with the Spirit. How do you do that? There's some other things that are listed there, by the way, if you keep reading in Ephesians chapter 5. But let's focus for our purpose on, for just a moment on speaking to one another, psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. We are to sing. This is one of those passages, a positive command uh, that we should be filled with the Spirit, and we do so by singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Connected with that there, I didn't underline it for our purposes, but that we speak to one another. You may have a Bible or a version you may go back to Colossians 3.16, which is kind of the parallel passage here. You may have a version that talks about teaching. really like that word being used there. Because when we sing, we are teaching. Have you ever been taught by a song? Have you ever thought about uh, well, the words that you're using and said, hmm, that's kind of interesting? Have you ever thought about the words that you're singing and said, is that right? Is that biblical? Is that really the way that the Bible teaches that? Because, you know, songs are not inspired uh, are these folks who have written great songs that are very encouraging, songs that the world loves. Those folks are not inspired by the Holy Spirit. Could I write a song and, and try to promote it for us to sing here and have all kinds of false teaching? Well, I guess I could. So we need to teach one another and teach and be sure that what we're teaching is uh, going along with the Bible and that we're singing and making melody. Again, for time, we're going to have to just kind of leave that part there. But I thought it would be beneficial for us to consider, as we begin to conclude our thoughts, at least three reasons here of why we kind of enjoy a cappella singing, why we might love it. This, these are not necessarily the biblical reasons, although you see them going along with it. You see some of the principles that we see on the pages of the New Testament. But I saw an article by a good brother of mine, and it said, Why I love our a cappella singing. Well, he's not the authority, and, and why we enjoy it wouldn't be the authority, because I like lots of things that, that wouldn't be authorized for us to do in worship, but it is something for us to consider. Number one, why do we in, appreciate or enjoy, why can it be beneficial for us to engage in a cappella singing? Number one, it's easier for us to keep the main thing the main thing. You may have heard preachers use that phrase before. I do believe that I've used it from time to time here in the pulpit, but... Why are we here this morning? You know, one of the great benefits is that we get to see one another. It's why we continue to promote this idea that we want you to be here. We love the fact that we have an opportunity to live stream and that folks can be at home, especially when they're sick and that kind of thing. But through this time of live streaming, it's been a challenge for us as preachers and even for our elders to try to tell you and promote to those folks who are in the congregation and around the world, it's important that you be gathered together. To watch online is an okay alternative from time to time, and it certainly served a purpose here during this year of a pandemic, but we come together. We come together to encourage one another. We do that when we sing. By the way, there's one person who's preaching. There's one person who's praying up here in front of us, leading us in prayer. But we can sing to one another. And we encourage one another by our presence. And we're thankful for that opportunity. But what's the main thing that we're here for as well? And that is to worship our God. To give praise unto Him. And if that is our purpose, to be here to worship Him, there are a lot of distractions that can take place. And oftentimes, it's easy for those when they add things to worship, when they add additions to worship, such as a great and beautiful guitar solo or some type of, of drums or piano or things like that, that it can begin to distract us. It's also, I would say, true and might even argue that, that I think it's pretty hard for a guitar to praise God in that sense. If we're singing to one another, if we're singing to God, we're using the fruit of our lips. It's kind of hard for mechanical instruments to do that. And so when we sing together and we sing with our voices, we have an opportunity to help us keep the main thing the main thing. Now, there are certainly distractions that can take place even when we have our a cappella singing together. But when I am singing, I'm trying to pay attention to my words, what I'm saying. I'm singing to God. I'm thinking about who I'm singing to. Then more often than not, I'm going to be worship in the, worshiping in the correct manner. And it's important that we think about that. And it helps us when we use our voices singing and making melody in our heart to the Lord. Number two, 
We might say we can enjoy and appreciate our a cappella singing because I want to do what they did, and the they being the early church. This is another great study that can take days and, and you know, to go through all this, but if you do your history and you go back and look, it's almost a thousand years, a thousand years or so before, and some people even say around 1,300 before that, that instruments are really accepted into to certain denominations into their worship. For thousands of years, people worship with their voices only. We say, or as we said earlier, we see it on the pages of the New Testament. Uh, the early church fathers, we call them, the, the non-inspired writers recorded that Christians were singing. I want to do what they did because that was the way, even as they were not very far removed from Jesus here on this earth and the establishment of the church and those men being led by the Holy Spirit, they were singing praises unto God. It is an interesting study to consider those things, even going back to our word a cappella, like we said earlier, in the style of the church. Those folks were singing. I want to do what they did. Are they the only authority? Absolutely not. We've already talked about biblical authority, but we see that there. And I want to do what they did. And number three, I don't want to add to what God has said. Now, this is a sermon in and of itself very often to consider that we go by the authority of God and we want to do simply what God has said. As we quoted a few moments ago from Paul, uh, that we don't want to go beyond what is written. There are other passages that we could focus on this morning that, that talk about this idea that we follow exactly what God has given us for instructions, exactly what those men, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, wrote down for us to read on the pages of our New Testament, that we would know how we should worship God, that we would worship Him, He is the object or the person that we worship, and we do so in spirit and in truth as Jesus talks about in John chapter 4. Why is it that we don't use instruments of music or mechanical instruments of music in our worship? Why is it that we believe and practice our a cappella singing? This is quite the controversial thing because, you know, I was kind of being facetious, of course, and joking with the family feud, but, but it is one of the top things that people want to talk about. I would challenge you, and we said this in our Wednesday night class, if you've been with us or are able to view it online, but, but when you discuss with someone, this is not the best place to begin. All right, This is not the best place to start because there are lots of other things that can come about. When we talk about the, the guitar praising God or we even begin into the idea of clapping and people who clap along with things when it comes to our worship, there's lots of discussions to be had, and it's important that when, especially when we're studying with someone and teaching them about Christ, Let's not jump here first. Let's talk about Christ. Let's talk about the church. But it is certainly something that is important for us to know and to understand so that we are sure, I am sure, you are sure, the church at Saudi is sure that we are worshiping God in spirit and in truth, that we are doing all things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that we are doing the will of the Father. And that's important, very important. Some of you have been putting your notes up and, and pulling your songbooks out if you choose to use them. As we begin to conclude our thoughts here, we're going to extend the Lord's invitation, as we always do. As we said, one of the great benefits of being together is that we encourage one another. Now, this is one of those sermons that, that someone may say uh, they're considering their life, but this really doesn't have anything to do with that, and it doesn't. It's something important for us to study and to talk about. But maybe there's something else going on. Maybe you heard something over the last few days. Maybe you've even thought about something as we were singing or something else that we were doing and partaking of here in our worship this morning or just a verse that you were thinking about, including the authority that you go by. As we pause here in this point of our worship, we'll be singing to encourage you. If you need to become a Christian this morning, that you would think about God's simple plan of salvation. It's what is necessary for a person to become gospel obedient, being in Christ allowing His blood to wash away your sins. We would gladly assist you in that this morning, taking place, taking part in that very act. Or if you'd like to study more, we would do that with you even this day because it's that important that you be in Christ, added to the church by the Lord so that you can begin to live faithfully. And probably many of you are here and you've done that in times past, but it's possible that you've wandered away, that you've allowed things of this world to get you down and to cause you to sin. And maybe you want the prayers of the church to help you with that. It's part of the reason we can come together to pray with you and for you. Maybe there's something else in your life you're struggling with. It's part of the beauty that we can be with one another and encourage one another. Whether you need to become a Christian, come back to Him, or you need the prayers of the church, we'll be singing to encourage you as we stand together and as we sing.
gently and tenderly Jesus is calling, calling for you and for me. Feel the portals, he's waiting and watching, watching for you and for me. Once from life for sin, sick soul, Christ did every burden roll. Now I walk redeemed and whole, hand in hand with Jesus. Hand in hand we walk each day, hand in hand along the way. Walking blood, I will not stray, hand in hand with Jesus. In my night of dark despair, Jesus heard and answered prayer. Now I'm walking free as air, hand in hand with Jesus. Hand in hand we walk each day, hand in hand along the way. Walking down, I will not stray, hand in hand with Jesus. From the straight and narrow way, praise the Lord, I must not stray, for I'm walking every day, hand in hand with Jesus. Hand in hand we walk each day, Hand in hand along the way, walking thus I will not stray, hand in hand with Jesus. When the stars are backward rolled, and his home I shall behold, I will walk those streets of gold, hand in hand with Jesus. Hand in hand we walk each day, hand in hand along the way, walking the I will not stray.
pray, hand in hand with Jesus. Father in prayer, our Father and our God, how great thou art. We come to thee, Father, giving you praise, honor, and glory in all things, for we know that every good and perfect gift coming from you. We thank you, Father, for your love, for we know that you loved us so much that you gave your own Son for us, that we may have everlasting life. We thank you, Father, that we can walk and talk with you each hour, each minute of every day, that you're always by our side. Father, we thank you for our congregation here. I know that we are so blessed that we could come here and worship you. Father, we thank you that we can be with together with one another and show our love for one another. Father, bless and be with the sick of our congregation. Bless and be with our elders, our, con our ministers, our missionaries. Help them to continue to teach and preach thy word and lead us in such a way that, that will be pleasing unto you. Father, we thank you for our great country. Continue to bless us and watch over us and help us all to realize we need to turn back to you on a true and loving God and live as you would want us to. Father, go with us through this day, throughout life. Forgive us of our sins and help us to always look to you for the light of our guidance. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. <laughs> 